Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Ethan Sims, and I'm uh, a member of the Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and the, pro uh, not the program manager, but the medical director for sustainability at St. Luke's. Um, and welcome to the first lecture in the 2023 Climate and Health Lecture Series co-sponsored by Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and St. Luke's uh, Sustainability Program. Um, we've got a great series uh, for the year. Our first three lectures will be in the spring, then we'll have three further lectures in the fall. Um, our three lectures for the spring will be today, which you'll hear much more about and hear the lecture itself in just a moment. Um, and then on April 12th at the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine, we'll have a, a live session there featuring Dr. Sky Blue and Dr. Christine Hahn talking about emerging infections in the setting of a changing climate. And then on May 17th, uh, back here at the St. Luke's Plaza, Dr. Bill Wepner and Helen Brown will be speaking about the Idaho Climate Economic Impact Assessment. Um, both those lectures will be noon. Um, again, they'll be live in the auditoriums that they're presented in, but also uh, recorded and available live online as today is. Um, today, we've got a really exciting uh, topic that we've spoken about a little bit before, uh, both at St. Luke's um, and there's been quite a bit of uh, growing national awareness about this issue. Um, we have three uh, speakers, uh, an international, a national, and a local expert on the topic um, that I'm excited to uh, have with us today, and I want to thank them all for their participation. Um, first up is going to be Dr. Greg Fury. Uh, Dr. Fury is a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he serves as a medical director of climate and sustainability. In this role, he works to prepare clinicians to address current and emerging health threats from climate change and to reduce the environmental impact of clinical care. He's a member of the Brigham Climate Action Council and the Mass General Brigham Climate and Sustainability Leadership Council. Dr. Fury graduated from Princeton University and Harvard Medical School, completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at Yale. He also wrote an outstanding op-ed in the New York Times about this specific topic, and I would encourage you all to seek it out and take a look for further reading. Dr. Fury, thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you all so much for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, but also to have this opportunity to talk about an issue that really has been largely invisible in the United States, um, but hopefully we are bringing more attention to it. And that's really the issue of meter dose inhalers and their contribution to climate change. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about how we can address that while also ideally improving clinical care. Um, so just today's objectives, um, we're going to review healthcare's contribution to climate change broadly and meter dose inhaler's contribution more specifically, and then discuss some opportunities to improve clinical care while reducing the climate impact of inhaled drug delivery devices. Um, so I think most people in this audience are probably aware of this, but I can't begin this without at least touching on why we're discussing this topic. And first, and that's largely because we all know that climate change is having a dramatic impact on public health um, through many different pathways, which I'm not gonna go through today, um, but suffice it to say that climate change is really one of, if not the greatest public health threat of our time. Um, but paradoxically, the healthcare sector is a, making a relatively substantial proportion to um, total greenhouse gas emissions. So if the global healthcare sector were a country, it'd be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. So, and I think hopefully we can all agree that contributing to death and disease through the environmental impacts of clinical care is fundamentally at odds with our mission and values. Um, and it turns out that if you begin looking at the different ways in which healthcare contributes to climate change, and you look at kind of each of the different components, and I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, um, there's some emissions that are just come from the energy that we use to power our facilities, as well as some anesthetic gases, electricity that we consume, um, everything kind of in our supply chain and our waste stream. But if you look at, there's just one, so over here, these are things that are in this kind of background white box or things that are directly under our control as healthcare professionals. And you can see that meter dose inhalers fall into that category. And that's largely because um, the gases, the propellants in, in um, meter dose inhalers are a um, potent greenhouse gas called hydrofluorocarbons. Um, so like I said, propellants in meter dose inhalers are potent greenhouse gases. 
There are two main hydrofluorocarbon propellants that are used, um, HFA-134 and HFA-227, with global warming potentials of 1,300 to 3,300 times that of CO2, um, respectively. So these are very, so needless to say, these are very uh, potent greenhouse gases, and collectively their contribution to climate change is significant, even if the relative volume that is being produced is relatively small. Um, so we know that there are about 144 million MDIs sold in the U.S. Um, in 2020, and that's the cumulative emissions associated with that are about are equivalent to about 500 the emissions from 500,000 cars driven for a year. Other ways of trying to understand the magnitude of that impact, a large <clears throat> study of the National Health Service in the U.K. found that meter dose inhalers contributed about four percent of their total carbon footprint. Um, and um, GSK, which makes um, Ventolin, has acknowledged that the propellants in the meter dose inhalers that they sell account for 45% of their total greenhouse gas emissions. So a huge multinational pharmaceutical company um, with a big carbon footprint and meter dose inhalers make up a very substantial fraction of that. Um, so this is a big problem with healthcare and one that we have the ability to do something about. And really, I would say there are kind of four big buckets of things that we can do to begin to address this problem. Um, we'll go through them in a little more detail, but briefly improve disease management, alternative low carbon inhalers, novel low global warming potential propellants, and a number of other kind of smaller um, but important ways to address this problem. So let's start with um, improved disease management. And so I think the, the key premise here for those who are not routinely treating people with um, asthma and COPD is that those two diseases, which represent the largest, um, the two largest diseases for which, like the two largest respiratory conditions in the, in the United States and really the world, and for which we use meter dose inhalers, um, are treated in a couple of ways. First, we use meter dose inhalers or we use inhalers in general to as both a preventive medication. That's to prevent flares of those disease diseases. But occasionally, when people have flares of disease, then we similarly will use these inhaled um, delivery devices to try and treat those flares. People who have really well controlled disease should never need to use that those reliever medications to treat flares. Ideally, we should be preventing flares from occurring. Um, and so What's recently been identified is that, and this is a lot of this data comes from a study called the Sabina study in the UK, is that um, excessive use of these reliever medications is actually um, contributes a substantial proportion to the total greenhouse gas emissions associated with meter dose inhaler use. So in the UK, similar to the US, many of the, um, there's a high, util high utilization of meter dose inhalers for treating respiratory disease. And because the UK is a little bit farther ahead of us um, in this work, they're able to quantify emissions associated with all aspects of asthma care. So not just the medications, but emissions associated with going to um, a regular doctor visit for an emergency department visit or an urgent care visit, a hospitalization. Um, and what they found is that, <clears throat> that the emissions associated with just meter dose inhaler use for treating um, or meter dose inhalers used for, um, for relief of flares. Um, the medication with large use for that are short-acting beta agonists or SABA. Here in the U.S., it's albuterol. There, they call it salbutamol. Um, represents a significant portion of that total um, impact. So they found that patients who have poorly controlled asthma, so people who are using three or more canisters per year of albuterol, um, had three times greater greenhouse gas emissions than those with well-controlled asthma. And that's shown over here in this chart. So I'll walk you through it a little bit. So the gray bars represent emissions associated with all aspects of asthma care per patient per year. And the blue bars represent the emissions that are associated with just the short-acting beta agonist use or albuterol. Um, and you can see, and 
This bar all the way on the right are those with uncontrolled asthma, and over here are patients with well-controlled asthma. So people who are appropriately being prescribed the preventive medications and therefore aren't having frequent flares of their asthma that require the use of this reliever medication have a much smaller carbon footprint than those who have poorly controlled asthma. And you can see that this big difference between um, the emission per patient per year for care amongst the non-controlled versus controlled is largely driven by the difference in, oops, sorry, difference in this kind of blue bar, which represents their, their short-acting beta agonist use. So the point is, if we could just control people's asthma better so that they weren't using so much um, albuterol or their reliever medications, that alone would go a long way to reducing emissions associated with meter dose inhalers. Um, so the other piece of this is that it aligns with many other objectives of ours when we're treating asthma, both quality and kind of value-based care. So we know that poorly controlled asthma is associated with increased morbidity and mortality across all levels of disease severity. And your likelihood of having an asthma exacerbation or, or death due to an asthma flare actually correlates with the amount of the short-acting beta agonist or reliever medication that you're using. So, um, <clears throat> so by better controlling asthma, we're not only reducing emissions, but we're really providing better care and improving outcomes. Furthermore, Treating poorly controlled asthma is really expensive. In the US, we spend $300 billion in direct healthcare costs over 20 years, or it's anticipated that we're gonna spend $300 billion in direct healthcare costs over 20 years for treating poorly controlled asthma. So if we can just control people's asthma, we're also gonna be saving the healthcare system a lot of money. And lastly, I'll say that it really aligns with health equity goals as well, because we know that, um, Communities of color and other socioeconomically disadvantaged um, communities bear a greater burden of asthma disease as well as poorer access to care and in general receive um, worse care and, and experience a higher rate of poorly controlled asthma. So there are a number of aligned goals here um, just by trying to better control people's asthma. So the second lever, this would be um, alternative low carbon inhalers. So <clears throat> there are other inhalers other than meter dose inhalers that don't contain propellants. Um, and essentially, unlike meter dose inhalers that use a propellant to expel the medication or propel the medication into the airways, um, dry powder inhalers essentially require uh, um, patients to like, suck on the device to create negative pressure and essentially inhale the medication into their airways. Um, and because there's no propellant, there's a, they, they are associated with a much smaller um, carbon footprint. And that's shown here. Um, on the left, you can see a number of dry powder inhalers. On the right are meter dose inhalers. You may not recognize all the names here because some of them, because this is a study from the UK. Um, <clears throat> But down at the bottom here, it essentially shows the emissions associated with each inhaler over its lifespan from the time it was manufactured to the time it was disposed. Um, and really it's the, the use phase that really drives the increased emissions associated with meter dose inhalers because the propellant is consistently being expelled into the atmosphere. There's also a substantial uh, uh, component due to the, to the end of life phase when they are thrown away and essentially, essentially whatever propellant is left is ultimately released into the atmosphere as well. So <clears throat> the other key point here is that for many patients, but not all, low carbon inhalers are, are clinically equivalent. So for, patient, for very young patients um, who, or for patients with severe respiratory disease who can't generate enough negative pressure to pull in the medication from a dry powder inhaler, they are not, um, they are not good um, options for, for treating asthma or COPD, but for most other patients, they are clinically equivalent. And we know that because other countries like Sweden use dry powder inhalers at a much higher rate than we do in the US, but they achieve better asthma outcomes. Um, and we know that people, when switch, we switch to dry powder inhalers because they don't have a propellant, the emissions associated with treating asthma are significantly reduced. And that was demonstrated in the sulfur lung study, which basically took patients who are um, with asthma who are being treated with um, 
a combination of a of a controller medication, an inhaled corticosteroid, and a long-acting reliever medication called a, um, a beta agonist. They were switched from a meter dose inhaler of that medication to a dry powder inhaler version of that medication. Um, I'm showing over here on the right, you can see the emissions that were the emissions reductions associated with that switch. So in gray is the usual care. So these were people who were using a meter dose inhaler for both a preventive medication and a reliever medication. Over here are people who are using um, a, a dry powder inhaler for their preventive medication and a meter dose inhaler for their reliever medication. And essentially they have their the amount of the, the emissions per year per patient. Um, and looking at that just by the maintenance medication or the rescue medication, you can see that those with the, the change is really due to the switch from the from the um, meter dose inhaler maintenance medication to the dry powder inhaler. But there is a small improvement in the rescue only as well. And that's because they found that people who switched to the dry powder inhaler actually had better disease control than people who are using a meter dose inhaler for um, maintenance therapy. And then the last thing I want to comment on here is just um, this is, is, is single maintenance and reliever therapy or SMART, um, which is now recommended by international gui um, guidelines for treating asthma, really of essentially every um, level of disease, disease severity. Um, <clears throat> and the point is that if we go from a traditional way of treating asthma, which was using a meter dose inhaler for maintenance and reliever to <clears throat> a dry powder inhaler maintenance, and a meter dose inhaler um, reliever, you essentially have admission, um, associated emissions. But using a meter dose inhaler as single maintenance in a single maintenance and reliever therapy strategy achieves a similar reduction in emissions. Um, in the rest of the world, except for the United States, um, the typical medication used for, um, for, for SMART is Simbacort. Um, it's available as a dry powder inhaler. Unfortunately, it's not available here in the United States. Um, we don't have time to go into why that is, um, but it is an area in which um, would, would be making those products available here in the United States would go a long way towards improving um, emissions associated with asthma care. Um, next, or I just wanted to touch on some you know, novel low global warming potential propellants. Um, so some of you may remember the history of um, meter dose inhalers going back to the 2000s when the Montreal Protocol essentially <clears throat> phased out the prior generation of propellants, which were chlorofluorocarbons, um, because they were contributing to depletion of the ozone layer. It turns out that chlorofluorocarbons are also very potent greenhouse gases, so it's a good thing for the environment and for the climate that we phase out chlorofluorocarbons, not only from meter dose inhalers, but also from um, um, as refrigerants um, and air conditioning, which is where they're largely used. Um, but those propellants were replaced by this new generation of um, the hydrofluorocarbon MDIs. And those of you who were practicing back in the 2000s may remember this because there was a substantial increase in the cost of um, of asthma care as a consequence of this. The pharmaceutical companies essentially used this as an opportunity to place medications that were previously generic back on patent and then extend patent protection for years. Um, so there's a new, there are essentially new, new propellants that are being proposed or that are being developed that have no global warming potential or very low global warming potential. And the pharmaceutical companies are beginning to bring those to market probably in the, the middle to later part of this decade. Um, and that's really being driven by this international agreement, the Kigali Amendment to the Pro Montreal Protocol that's focused on phasing out hydrofluorocarbons. Um, and I think, and while this potentially represents a real opportunity because we could continue using meter dose inhalers um, without having such a dramatic climate impact. I think the challenge is, or the problem is that I anticipate that the pharmaceutical companies are going to once again use this as an opportunity to place these medications back on patent, and it's going to result in significant cost 
hikes for um, for patients and payers. And I'm not going to go through this chart in detail over on the right here, but this is a really interesting study that was recently published in Health Affairs that looks at the inhaled drug delivery device market and how pharmaceutical companies have essentially been able to take a um, initially patent initial pa initially patented medication and reformulate it, create new d drug delivery devices that continue to use the same medication, but essentially allow them to maintain patent protection for that for decades and decades. And so if their past, um, if our past experience with pharmaceutical companies is any predictor of what we can see in the future, um, I suspect that they're going to try to do the same thing um, with these new um, low global warming potential propellants. So if anything, that provides another compelling reason to begin switching people to dry powder inhalers, because essentially those are gonna end up, I suspect, being more cost-effective treatments for, for asthma. Um, lastly, um, lever four, just some of the other solutions, and I'm not gonna go into these in great detail because um, um, we're gonna hear more about them in some of the future presentations, but there are other kind of critical ways that we can be working with our patients to essentially reduce emissions associated with treatment of asthma and COPD. So with that, I'm gonna stop. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Green. Uh, great. Um, uh, hi, everyone. I guess um, I'll introduce myself. If yeah, I'm a family physician in Toronto, um, and I am the president-elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. I'm also a fellow with the Center for Sustainable Health Systems here in Toronto, um, which uh, is the home for this project called Cascades, which is a silly acronym, something like creating an atmosphere for sustainability, something, something in our health system. I don't know. Um, and I've worked extensively on this issue in Canada. So I'm here to share uh, some of the ways we've actually implemented change. Um, I don't have any relationship with financial sponsors. Uh, you've already heard this, um, but I really do like this image of a meter dose inhaler, which is the equivalent, the average meter dose inhaler is the equivalent of driving 175 miles like London to Sheffield, um, whereas the average dry powdered inhaler is equivalent to driving four miles, <laughs> London to another bit of London. Um, but you've already heard this. So these are my levers, uh, or this is how we've structured our interventions uh, out of Cascades uh, for uh, curbing MDI-related emissions in primary care. The first is reduce unnecessary inhaler use. Um, then prioritize low carbon inhalers. Also bring environmental sustainability into discussions of inhaler type with our patients. Ensure um, appropriate inhaler use and excellent disease control, which you've already heard. Uh, and then ensure appropriate inhaler disposal as well. Um, and then I'm at towards the end of my section of the presentation, I'm also gonna talk a bit about um, actions that can be taken uh, in hospitals, in hospital-based care uh, to curb meter dose inhaler related emissions because uh, the approach needs to be actually quite different. So um, there are policy changes, operational changes and different educational campaigns that uh, can help with change in, in a hospital. So to start with actions in primary care, uh, so Choosing Wisely says, don't diagnose or manage asthma without spirometry. Um, and yet we often see patients who say they have asthma who have never had spirometry done. And in fact, there are studies that show that about a third of patients labeled with asthma do not have asthma on objective testing. And 80% of those with negative test results were actually on a medication for asthma. So if you have a patient and, and you're not sure whether they've had spirometry done, do the spirometry, you may be able to de-prescribe. There's also the question of uh, viral cough and post-viral cough. Um, so the average observed typical duration of um, average viral cough is 18 days. Patient expectation for duration of cough is five to nine days. And I would say physician expectation of duration of cough is like close to that five to nine days. I think when I first saw this data, I was like, really 18 days? Uh, and I think often we are prescribing uh, short acting beta agonist to patients without a diagnosis of asthma because we feel like we need to do something. And there's no evidence of benefit for short acting beta agonist in post-viral cough or inhaled corticosteroids, 
or combination inhalers. And these are um, three Cochrane reviews that were done. Uh, so there is no reason to be prescribing any kind of inhaler in post-viral cough. And what are the harms of overprescribing? Patients label themselves as sick um, and the medication, the inhaler can then end up being re-prescribed in future, say, viral illnesses. Um, there's obviously the financial cost of the patient repair. Um, there are medication side effects. Um, albuterol causes jitteriness, uh, tachycardia. And then, of course, there's the environmental cost. So de-prescribe. Then you've already heard about this. So prioritize uh, low-carbon inhalers whenever possible. But I'll add um, that there are these low volume HFA MDIs. Um, and um, uh, what those are is they contain um, uh, ethanol as an HFA sparing agent. So there's actually far less propellant in the device. Um, and so I don't know, maybe the pharmacist uh, Kathleen, I believe, who's speaking uh, last, can talk about which of those inhalers are available in Idaho, because I'm not sure. But in Canada, for example, there are two versions of albuterol available as low volume and, and multiple versions available just as high volume. And the difference is um, a low volume HFA short acting beta agonist is about driving 39 kilometers, I, oh, I think in kilometers, <laughs> whereas um, uh, high volume HFA is like 300 kilometers. So it's, it's an order of magnitude difference. Um, you've already heard about this, um, so I'll just skip over it. Um, but I'll just add um, that dry powdered inhalers are actually preferred by most people. Um, so they're preferred for school-aged children. They're generally easier to use. Patients tend to actually have better technique. There are multiple studies um, uh, showing that. And, and they also um, uh, always come with a dose counter, whereas many versions of Ventolin albuterol do not count with a dose, do not come with a dose counter. And so patients are often using an empty inhaler and thinking they're receiving their medication. Um, or the reverse, they're throwing away a medication that's still half full. Um, and, and that obviously is also causing problems to the environment, um, if not to the patient's disease. Uh, and so with dry powdered inhalers, they always come with a dose counter and that makes them a lot easier to use. We do still recommend meter dose inhalers with spacers for preschoolers, for those with poor inspiratory flow, those with dementia who maybe can't coordinate. But but as you heard from Dr. Fury, the vast majority of our patients, um, 70 to 90%, uh, do fine with a dry powdered inhaler. When meter dose inhalers are necessary, as you heard, choose small volume relievers. Um, uh, and of course, meter dose inhalers are also often needed in an acute exacerbation. And so in the emergency department, you may often be needing to use a meter dose inhaler, um, but you should always be choosing those smaller volume relievers and always use with spacer as well. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of resources that we've developed um, to engage in quality improvement practice change because, you know, education is necessary but not sufficient to actually change prescribers' behavior. Um, so this is just one example, and all of this is available on the Cascades Canada website, which I will share in the chat when I'm done speaking. Um, and so we've developed two playbooks, one for primary care and one for hospital-based care. Uh, the primary care playbook is there right now. It was published in September. Uh, the hospital-based care one is actually being published on Friday, so fresh, hot off the presses, um, but it'll be on the same website. Um, so this is from the primary care playbook. It is just an example of a prescription favorite that we've developed in, in my family health, my, my family practices e EMR, um, where if the provider types in hashtag inhaler, all the different inhalers are pre-populated, all the prescriptions are pre-populated, and all the DPIs are available, or sorry, all the MDIs are available to prescribe, but each of them, if you click on it, it says, um, uh, there, it says, consider first DPI, exam example, Advair Discus. Um, so that's just one nudge without causing alert fatigue, because we didn't want to do an alert, which would, you know, people just click through. So this is a nudge, because this actually is makes it easier for the prescriber to prescribe the inhaler properly. So they actually are using it. Um, uh, we've done some qualitative re uh, evaluation and, and, and providers are using it because it's actually helpful to them. And then they see this choose first DPI. 
This is a inhaler renewal request letter that we've developed um, that we can send to, to our patients when we receive a faxed request from the pharmacy for uh, albuterol renewal. Um, and it's just a form template saying, you know, you could consider switching. Uh, here in Canada, um, Ventolin discus is very, very expensive, um, but terbutaline is available as a short-acting beta agonist. DPI um, called Bricanel. And so that's the one that we usually switch patients to because it's uh, about equivalent in cost. Um, and so that's what it says here in, in this form letter. Now, I had also, so the number three is to bring sustainability into discussions of inhaler type. And this actually is um, important to most of our patients, um, there was a study by Wilkinson um, and published in Thorax in 2017 that showed that between 70 and 80 percent of patients do care about this. And, and when they learn about it, they they are happy to make the switch. And anecdotally, in my own practice, I have found that like when I bring it up, people are very open to, you know, causing less harm to the environment. And so we have uh, this op um, uh, office poster that we've developed um, with patient input um, that's also available in our um, tool, uh, in our playbook. Then there's also ensuring appropriate inhaler use and excellent disease control. You've kind of already heard about that, so I won't belabor the point, but um, Dr. Fury did touch on these international guidelines that changed in 2021, um, advising even those with mild asthma that they well, suggesting that they do better with um, the, the smart therapy. So um, using the combination inhaler as both a controller and reliever. Um, and um, yeah, so that was based on uh, Sigma-1 and Sigma-2 studies, um, which showed better prognosis, fewer exacerbations. Um, and actually, I hadn't seen that study that actually directly shows the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, so that's useful. Um, and then, of course, inhaler technique. Um, multiple studies show that inhaler technique uh, is generally poor. Between 12 and 71 percent of the time, patients are not using their inhaler correctly, uh, and in particular, patients who are using meter dose inhalers often are not using them correctly. Um, and um, Inhaler misuse is associated with increased hospitalizations, emergency visits, poor disease control, decreased quality of life. So we uh, should be uh, ensuring appropriate inhaler use at every visit, really, every encounter, and, and referring to our colleagues, pharmacists, nurse educators, um, when needed to, to teach appropriate inhaler technique. And then finally, uh, ensuring appropriate inhaler disposal. Although the bulk of emissions come from the use phase, um, there are additional emission savings from properly disposing of the inhaler. So both the plastic and the aluminum can be recycled. And then the meter dose inhaler, um, what's left, can be incinerated, which degrades the HFC chemicals. And um, they are no longer than uh, as uh, polluting. And we've developed actually um, an office poster about disposal, just advising our patients to bring their inhalers back to the pharmacy when they're done and not throw them in the garbage. So um, using a quality improvement approach um, at multiple sites across the country, we have been uh, guiding different uh, primary care practitioners in engaging in this quality improvement. Um, and this is just a picture from uh, the Royal College in the UK, which has added sustainability as a seventh dimension of quality. Um, we're, we haven't gotten that far here in Canada, and I don't think you have in the United States, but um, still you can use a QI approach to, to, to work on this change. And I'll just show you this poster. It's actually a resident project that I co-supervised um, at St. Joseph's Hospital here in Toronto. And um, they actually did multiple change uh, cycles, uh, multiple interventions. You can see here, there was a education clinic posters. They actually um, uh, proactively emailed all patients prescribed meter dose inhalers, um, asking whether they would be interested in discussing a switch to dry powdered inhalers. They also created prescription favorites and other EMR resources. Um, and look at this result. Like, it's actually astounding. Uh, it's a small practice, but still, they went from 72% meter dose inhalers to 36% meter dose inhalers, 64% dry powdered inhalers. That's over the course of a year. Uh, I was just blown away when I when I saw this. Um, and so this is actually the equivalent of, this is like pretty average for North America, Canada, and the US. And this is equivalent to Sweden and like continental Europe. Uh, so you can see that like there are some meter dose inhalers that we will continue to need to prescribe, but there's a huge change that you can make. 
So how much time do I have? Um, I will, yes, I have enough time. Good. Um, just go through a little bit an approach uh, in inpatient care. Now, with the caveat that I uh, am a primary care physician, um, but I have worked closely with um, Dr. Uh, Val Stoinova, um, who's an internist in Victoria, and her colleague, Celia Cully, who's a pharmacist, um, who've been driving this uh, initiative across the country here in Canada. So uh, they've developed this approach. So policy changes, operational changes, education campaign. Um, and I'll go through each of those. Um, but first, um, they talk about setting up the groundwork. Um, and so first is developing partnerships and uh, seeking organizational support. Uh, so you can assess your organization's readiness for sustainability, seek out your hospital strategic plan, see whether there's anything that's applicable to say sustainability in it. Um, or if there's nothing there, um, look to your state, look to your region, and really try to make a case based on existing organizations organizational mandates um, for, for sustainable change. Um, and then it's important to, to reach out to um, uh, stakeholders in your organization and, and engage them in, in supporting a, this process. So this is um, their stakeholder map, which is pretty impressive of um, all the different people involved in their um, Victoria, BC hospital, uh, who they developed relationships with to, to engage in this change. The um, next step is to create a process map of inhaler use. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into it, but for your institution, it's important to understand when inhalers get prescribed and dispensed. And so they, they looked at the time of patient admission to their tertiary center. And then they also looked at um, when patients get prescribed and dispensed inhalers when they're already admitted in admitted patients. Uh, and so it would be important to create a process map for your individual institution. They also developed change metrics so they could track pro progress again using that quality improvement approach. Um, and so they collected prescribing data through their uh, hospital-based software, Cerner software, um, with a custom extract of the inhalers dispensed to patients. And they were um, able to identify the number of orders written by providers monthly um, and stratified by site. Um, but they, and then they also collected dispensing data, which is perhaps different from prescribing data. Um, and they did that, and they actually had to use two different sources. So there was their like uh, software data from their Cerner module. Um, but then there's also ward stock, which was not always tracked with software. So they actually used inhaler restocking data on, on ward stock in order to uh, properly track those ward stock inhalers. Uh, and they also collected higher order financial information, uh, such as ordering data, purchasing data, and uh, associated costs. Um, and I'll just briefly review some of the actions that, that they took, again, with the caveat that it wasn't me. But um, some of the policy changes that they have been um, working on um, with a lot of patients. <laughs> um, first is multi-dose medication policy. So um, best practice for inpatient medication dispensing is a unit dose system um, in which patients are prescribed just sufficient medication for a 24-hour period, and that has been shown to increase patient safety, and it's actually more cost-effective. Of course, meter dose inhalers you know, don't come that way. Um, and they're often up to 200 doses in each MDI. Um, and typically, um, in most in, in, in institutions, these inhalers are discarded at discharge. They are not allowed to be uh, dispensed home with the patient. They cannot be reused. And the average length of stay in hospital is five to seven days. So that constitutes a huge amount of waste. Um, uh, so, so they went about creating a policy change to allow patients to take their inhaler home. Next is high versus low volume HFA. That's straightforward. They just um, wrote a hospital policy um, so that their hospital would only buy low volume HFAs. Like that's like a no brainer kind of, um, you know, get it on, on, on the purchasing agreements to, to only purchase those low volume HFAs because it makes a huge difference in terms of emissions and there's actually no difference in terms of patient care. 
And then finally, hospital formulary. So they ensured that the necessary dry powdered inhalers were available on the hospital, hospital formulary. And they also checked to make sure that those hospital formulary inhalers were available in the community because there actually at first was a mismatch. They were prescribing ventil and discus in hospital, which as I already mentioned, is quite expensive in Canada. And so they switched it to terbutaline in hospital um, for that short acting beta agonist. And then operational changes. Um, so they redesigned clinical order sets to nudge admitting physicians to prioritize low impact inhalers. They, they still provided, you know, MDIs as an option because especially if a patient is being admitted with a respiratory condition, they often need that meter dose inhaler, but at least the, the, the dry powdered inhaler was given as an option. And um, it was actually the preferred option in patients who are not having an acute exacerbation they also prioritized inhaler ward stock. Um, so inhaler ward stock um, is not labeled and so just often gets missed and, and um, got lost often. And so then multiple inhalers would be dispensed and like, you know, forgotten in drawers um, because it was prescribed from or dispensed from the ward stock without a patient label on it. Uh, and there's no need for a controller inhaler to be in the ward stock. And it was. So um, they switched their ward stock to only having short acting beta agonists in the ward stock because those are sometimes needed on an emergent basis. Um, and, and then finally, uh, in terms of operational changes, tamper sealing the inhaler cap. So um, the inhaler cap uh, in their in their hospital came in a plastic, sorry, the inhaler came in a plastic bag. Um, and it's just, it's a funny thing. And this is why you have to create your process map. Um, the plastic bag made the inhaler too big for the hospital drawers. So patients were just like losing their inhalers. Um, and so all of these unused inhalers would get lost and then discarded by nurses and porters and uh, housekeeping staff. So instead they switched to a tamper seal so that the inhaler could still be put in the drawer and had the patient label. And then if it was never used, it could be returned to the pharmacy. Um, and then I'll just, and with the educational campaigns. Um, and I think this is important. Uh, it's not just one educational campaign. You can't just have this grand rounds and that's it. You really need targeted educational campaigns at different um, uh, stakeholders. So for example, ph pharmacy technicians fight climate change and they actually included actions on these posters uh, and in the didactic talks that they gave that were specific to say pharmacy technicians so ensure that the tamper seal is intact, for example, um, encourage patients to uh, dispose of their inhalers appropriately. Uh, and they did the same for respiratory therapists, for uh, nurses. I mean, nurses are a very important part of this whole process. Uh, and then of course for pharmacists, they also did education for housekeeping staff and for porters as well, um, because they actually found that a huge number, up to 40% of their inhalers were just going missing. <laughs> so like someone would be dispensed an inhaler in the eMERGE and then, and, and then another one on the unit and then another one, et cetera. Um, and so uh, that was a very important part of their project was educating each of these um, staff. Um, so all these resources are available. I mean, they're all very Canada specific, but uh, they can be, you're free to use them and adapt them. Um, and they're all available on the website that I'll put in the chat. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was a, an amazing tour of how we can replicate this process here uh, at St. Luke's. And that's certainly something that we are working on doing with Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and St. Luke's Sustainability. Um, we are currently exploring uh, taking on a campaign similar to what you've put forward in Canada um, to prioritize lower carbon medications in our healthcare system, um, you know, starting with patients and prescribers and working all the way up through pharmacy and therapeutic committees. Um, our next speaker is Kathleen Silviera. Kathleen is a transitions of care pharmacist at St. Luke's uh, working in Southwest Idaho. She's passionate about therapy optimization, medication reconciliation, and patient education. Kathleen strives to be climate conscious in all areas of her life with a large emphasis on inhaler prescribing. Kathleen, go ahead and take it away. Hi, Ethan. Yeah, my computer is messing up. I'm having some technical difficulties this morning. Do you think that you would be able to pull up my slides so then I can just talk through this microphone? Yes, just give me one second. I'll pull your slides up. Thank you.
And then I'll just need one moment and then I will be good to go. Okay, Kathleen, uh, whenever you're ready, just go ahead and let me know to advance, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, so my name is Kathleen. I am a Transitions of Care Pharmacist at the St. Luke's Napa location, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the dry powdered inhaler availability and cost within St. Luke's health system. So, as our other speakers have already said, uh, dry powdered inhalers significantly reduce it carbon emissions. And another thing, patients really prefer them. They're easier to use. And a lot of times they're once daily, which is really important when we're considering uh, adherence. All right, next slide, please. All right, so things I wanted to get started with were barriers to optimized inhaler therapy. So the first barrier is cost. Of course, we know these inhalers are very, very expensive. And a lot of the times pharmacies turn people away because they're too, too expensive through insurance. Another thing is variability of insurance coverage. Insurance formularies are ever changing. So sometimes they'll cover it, then the next year they might not. So keeping up on that is very difficult. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit later in the presentation. And then next, we have an improper device technique. As already mentioned, a lot of people are using their inhalers wrong and they're not getting the maximized benefit from them. And then lastly is lack of understanding of the role and expectations of maintenance inhalers. They discharge a lot of patients from the hospital with exacerbation of asthma, COPD, and it's very clear that um, they don't understand why they have to take it every day because it's not providing that reliever benefit that the albuterol is providing. So they're thinking that it's not helping them. So we'll talk about more of this later on. All right, next slide, please. All right, so these are the dry powder inhalers that are available in our system. So I separated them into three categories, primarily used in asthma, used in asthma and COPD, and primarily used in COPD. So the focus of this is really asthma here, but a lot of patients have overlap between asthma and COPD. So it's important to be able to see all of the options. There are 17 dry powdered inhalers that are available in our system. So the ones in blue I highlighted as these are the more common ones I see, and the pro air respiclic is becoming increasingly more common. And then we have the ones that are grayed out that are less common options. All right, next slide, please. All right, so cost of dry powdered inhalers. So this is our cash prices within St. Luke's. So other pharmacies are going to have different cash prices, um, but I just wanted to give you an idea that they are all expensive. The Pro Air Respiclic is the cheapest at $82, all the way up to about $700. So, uh, and again, I separated them into the more common and the less common. And I just also want to point that point out that only a couple of these inhalers show brand and generic costs. That's because most of them are not available as generic. So of the 17, only 15 here um, are brand only and only two are generic. So that definitely increases the cost. And then the ones with good insurance coverage are the more common, which makes sense than the ones with the um, less great insurance are, are less common. So it kind of just goes together there. All right, next slide. All right, so I just wanted to show um, the St. Luke's health system formulary. So this is for employees. So in Idaho, the largest employer is St. Luke's. So a lot of the patients that you're treating are going to be patients who have this insurance. So there are six different tiers. And the more common, the most common tier is tier three, preferred brand drugs. There's really not many tier one, which is preventative generic, because as I said, there's only two available generic. So as you can see, I highlighted the Wixella Inhub is just um, oh, the tier one, which is the Advair generic, um, but there's really not very many others. 
And then, so focusing back on the preferred brand, uh, we can see that we have a Noro, Arnuity, the Spirea of the Handy Healer. These are all preferred brands. So those would be the options that you'd want to prescribe first. And then you can see that I highlighted in yellow the Brio Ellipta, which is a, um, a tier four, which is a non-preferred brand drug. And that is going to require step therapy. So they must fail either the tier one advert generic or another tier three preferred brand before our insurance would cover the Brio Ellipta. And then you have, let's say, in Cruise, for example, for COPD, is just a tier four, and it is not step therapy. So that's just going to be a more expensive option. And um, so that is available. All right, next slide, please. All right, so within St. Luke's, there's two different plans. There's the PPO, and then there's the health save. First, I'll just go over the, the PPO plan. So Looking at that tier three, which is going to be our preferred brand, you have the 30-day supplies is going to be a minimum of $45 and a maximum of $90. So still quite pricey, but it, it does have some coverage. And then if you go up to a 90-day supply, it's actually more cost-effective with a minimum of $90 and a maximum of $180 per three months. And then the tier fours are more expensive, as you can see outlined on the chart. So really tier three for preferred brand are going to be what we're going to want to prescribe for our employees. All right, the next slide. So this is the health safe plan. So this plan is the cheaper plan and they're still the same tiers. So tier three preferred brand, there's going to be a lot less coverage here. A lot of these, you have to meet your deductible first. And just to give you insight of what that deductible is, is for individuals, it's $4,000 and for um, for families, it's $8,000. So if patients are getting these diagnoses of asthma, COPD, really anything that's going to require a lot of these brain meds, it's going to be best that they enroll in that PPO in the next enrollment period. Otherwise, they're going to be spending thousands of dollars. All right, next slide. All right, so another common patient population is patients who are on Medicaid. So the next three slides just kind of highlight what is available in the Medicaid formulary. Um, the ones in highlight on this formulary specifically are just changes from the previous formulary. So um, you can just ignore that. But really what I wanna show is that they do have GPIs as the preferred agent. So if we go to the next slide, Ethan, we can see that there's the asthma next twist tailor is going to be their preferred and then we have the advair and then simport which is mdi so the good thing with medicaid is if they fail one of these options then as long as it was prescribed in the last six months they can go on to the next option so that's where we get our annuity our brio the Trilogy, things like that. That's when those once daily DPIs that are really effective and really awesome uh, at preventing carbon emissions come into place. And a lot of patients that I see when I'm optimizing therapy at discharge are already on, especially at bearer support. So it's a nice and easy change for optimization. All right, next slide. Then again, this is just the Medicaid formulary again, showing those same types of things. So you guys can review that. We'll make sure you have access to the slides after. So we can just go on to the next. So next thing I wanted to talk about was Medicare Part D. So Medicare Part D uh, is really hard to just have one big formulary. The problem is, is that as of January 1st of this year, there are 800 and over 800 different plans of Medicare Part D that you can enroll in. So there's not one sure thing that is going to be covered or is not going to be covered. But from my experience, people either have really good coverage with very low copays, maybe like $3.95 copays, or they have to hit a deductible and then they have copays more at like $45 or $37 more commonly for these types of brand medications. And that's because they're paying lower premiums monthly compared to those other patients who are having the, those lower copays all around. So um, what we can tell patients a lot of the times, because when we're billing patients, we can tell if their deductible is 
met if how what and what their copay will be after their deductible is met. So a lot of the times it'll be okay. You have to pay five hundred dollars now, and then going forward, then it's only thirty seven a month. And that brings us to our next slide of what happens if the patient cannot afford their inhaler. Inhaler, they can't afford their deductible, and they can't afford their copay, or vice versa. A lot of things that we do at discharge is this is where I see the most is we have teams such as medication access or 340B within our system that allows us to help patients who are unable to afford their inhaler. So I always explain to the patient their deductible versus the copay. And sometimes it's just the deductible is too expensive for them. So what we'll do is we'll cover the cost of it and then the medication access team will get an automatic notification that we've used this program and they'll reach out to the patient and determine their financial eligibility going forward to see if we can help them with co-pays. Maybe $45 a month is too expensive, but we need these patients to be on this optimized inhalers. So it's very important that we get them and that we set them up for success in the future so that they're not back in our ERs and they're not back in our hospitals. So that is one of the main things that I can do at hospital discharge, making sure that patients are going to be able to pick up their needs. All right. Then that brings us to our one last slide, which is access to inhaler training. So as we've mentioned before, that technique of inhalers is, uh, is very, very commonly wrong. And that's with meter dose and with dry powdered. So St. Luke's, Boise, Meridian, and Napa locations within the hospital all have outpatient pharmacies with pharmacists that are available to educate patients. They're able to educate on technique, educate on the importance of the difference between a maintenance and a rescue inhaler. And we all have demos that are available within these three pharmacies. So if you're ever questioning if a patient is properly using their inhaler, send them our way. We'd be happy to go over it with them, show them a demo. We can use the teach back method. And it's really effective for patients to, to be able to spend some time with us. And lastly, there is a QR code here. If your patients aren't able to come in, I created this um, document that just has written and video instruction for each of the type of the device. So like the ellipta, the discus. Um, and all of the other devices. So you can check that out there and hopefully you find that helpful. And that's all I have for you today. Uh, and now I think we can answer some questions for you. Thank you so, so much, Kathleen. I, I would really encourage anyone uh, who hasn't already to scan that QR code. It is a really handy uh, document to look at. Um, and I think this, uh, Kathleen's presentation really brings up a, an excellent point um, that we are fortunate in the hospital and inpatient setting to have access to these transitional care pharmacists like Kathleen who are able to see all of these different aspects that affect uh, patients' access to medication and can help us select medications that are not only carbon efficient, but patients can afford, provide that instruction for them. And we are really loving uh, the access we have to these discharge pharmacists, transitional care pharmacists. I would love to see this kind of pervade throughout healthcare um, in in the St. Luke system, especially, but um, it, throughout the, the country, I think, because uh, it really adds an extra layer um, that, that we don't generally have access to as physicians. I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and I have one question that I wanted to ask all the speakers in general, um, which is that part of our current campaign at Idaho Clinicians for Climate Health is to organize a petition to ask that climate friendly medications be available and cost affordable. Um, there we go. Um, for patients and providers, um, we are hoping uh, that we can get a large number of signatures on a petition, but we just don't know who the right audience is to petition. Um, do you have thoughts? Is it the FDA? Is it insurance companies? Is it drug manufacturers? Who's the right audience to ask this question to? So I would say it's insurance companies. Insurance, I would say, runs this country. They decide what is and what is not covered. So the I, I believe insurance would be the best place to start since there are a lot of available dry powder inhaler options here. And to that effect, individual insurance companies, uh, are there specific ones we should be asking that are more prevalent in Idaho? Is it 
you know, asking Blue Cross. Um, what, what are your thoughts there, Kathleen? Um, I would say, yeah, getting all of the major ones. Um, Blue Cross is definitely one of the most prevalent um, ones that there are um, in, in Idaho that I've noticed. And then, of course, St. Luke's does have a decent amount of dry pattern already. Um, and then there's also the, the Medicare plans, too. Um, but that would probably be a lot more difficult to reach. Um, but I think Blue Cross would be a good start. Yeah, Samantha, I'll just add to that, I think that the pharmacy benefit managers, since many of the insurance companies all use kind of the same pharmacy benefit managers, may be another useful target. And, um, but I think petitioning like to this question of Medicare and all the different plans, like presumably Medicare itself, CMS has some control over this, I would hope. Um, and so that would be another potential target. I do think the FDA is relevant here because one of the biggest challenges that we face is that there just, I think, as was mentioned, there just aren't many generic versions of dry powder inhalers. And so we're really limited in terms of our options. And I think it will be pushed back from insurance companies until those are available because it costs them more as well. So, um, help like encouraging the FDA to change their process for approving um, either generics or bioequivalents um, would also be really helpful to, to increasing patient choice. I want to try to sneak one last question in. I had a question about uh, other medications that may be uh, similar to these MDIs in terms of their bad carbon profile with reasonable uh, similar patient care outcomes um, like the DPIs have. Um, do you know of other medications that have this similar profile of sort of equivalent effect with less carbon emissions associated with them that we could target going forward? I mean, of course, um, there's desflurane, which is an anesthetic gas um, that has a disproportionate, again, global warming potential um, and is unnecessary. Like there, I'm not an anesthetist, but uh, there are multiple equivalent options. Um, and it, you know, there's a push uh, to remove desflurane from hospital formularies, I think internationally. Yeah, I don't know if I have a whole lot more to add other than the fact that much of the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals is a black box. It's only because of this kind of particular nature of the that we can quantify the emissions associated with these gases that are released into the atmosphere, that we can even understand this problem with the level of precision that we can. Um, but for most pharmaceuticals, it's unclear what the associated emissions are, or even what the big drivers of emissions associated with those pharmaceuticals throughout their life cycle really are. Um, I think the question is, is it the manufacturer process, but or it could be just traveling to the farm, driving to the pharmacy to pick them up. So there, it's hard to come up with particular solutions until we have better data about the emissions associated with pharmaceuticals. Just add one thing, even though I know it's time, but uh, I mean, deep prescribing is always the right answer. So, uh, and so there are often cases, I think, where we should be thinking PPIs is one, one very, you know, ubiquitous example. Um, we should often be thinking more about deep prescribing. Um, because that's always going to reduce emissions. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all for your outstanding presentations and your time. Um, we wanted to share one last thing. Um, the Amanda's going to come up and talk to us, I think. Yeah, just real quick. I want to respect everyone's time because you guys are probably either on your lunch break or on your day off. So thank you so much to our speakers and everyone who participated. You can stay up if you want. <laughs> But um, if you're looking to get more involved locally with some of these efforts, I'm just going to put in the, um, the chat there. We have an event coming up, so we're going to be continuing to educate locally our, um, our patients and some of the offices that are doing the most prescribing for inhalers about everything we just learned and try to spread that message. And then we'll also be hosting a hike on May 7th, which is a Sunday in our local foothills. I know everyone here loves to hike, so... We're going to be having a few testimonials of some uh, asthmatics sharing their stories briefly, and then we're going to get out for the day and enjoy one another's company in the foothills. So you can sign up there. Um, and then I'll also put a link to our website for some more information and other events that are happening this spring.